Supplejack is an open source tool for metadata aggregation and discovery. Uh, it was developed by the National Library of New Zealand, which is, which is where I'm from, uh, the Digital New Zealand uh, unit there, uh, in concert with our development partner, Boost. Uh, we think it's a fabulous tool for allowing especially digital libraries to aggregate content from uh, all their different partner organisations uh, across whatever country you're working in, whatever domain. Uh, it's a really useful system for uh, collecting data from many different sources to many different levels of quality and then making it discoverable and available through uh, an easy to use RESTful API. Supplejack is a tool that was developed about four or five years ago. Uh, primarily we were using it for the Digital New Zealand website. Uh, but we realised that it was, could be a useful tool for many other organisations. So we spent some time to uh, make an open source version available, and so that's now uh, freely available for anyone to download on GitHub. Uh, so as well as the uh, um, New Zealand National Library, uh, it's used by other culture and heritage organisations in New Zealand. So for example, uh, Ngā Taonga Sound and Vision. Uh, Ngā Taonga is a Māori word uh, meaning treasures. And the Sound and Vision archive has uh, many film and audio uh, archival material. And they had very uh, diverse collections in uh, different tools. And we're really struggling to put those together into a cohesive interface. So they use Supplejack uh, as a layer on top of those tools to bring the information together and make a very simple discovery interface on the web. Uh, we're also working with the Texas Digital Library in America, and uh, there's a project in British Columbia in Canada uh, to introduce Supplejack to, again, solve the same sorts of problems of aggregating data from many different uh, resources together into a, a simple unified uh, web interface and also API. Uh, well, it's very permissive, I'd say. So you're able to develop your own uh, schema for, for the um, data model that you want to store. Uh, and that can uh, draw on uh, Dublin Core, you can draw on METS, you can draw on uh, your own uh, custom metadata schema and bring together those elements into one store. Um, but we had a bit of a challenge in New Zealand where we, there are some large institutions that are able to produce you know, high quality metadata in uh, PMI format, for example. But we also have a lot of quite small uh, organisations that have valuable uh, cultural heritage information but don't have the resources to maybe produce the quality of data that we'd, we'd like. So we wanted to create a system that was very adaptable to that. So we can ingest data from XML formats, we can scrape HTML, we can use RSS, we can use PMI, uh, we can use flat file formats uh, to bring all of that stuff and, and put it in one place and give it a consistent level of quality. Um, so it, it's a very useful tool in a, in a small um, organisation like ours. My point of view as users is at one remove, so I'm, I manage the systems at, at Digital New Zealand, so really I consider my users to be uh, those who have adapted the API. Um, so we have um, Europeana uses our API, for example, for data. Uh, we have quite a few local cultural and heritage organisations, again, that uh, can run searches on their own websites that draw from the Digital New Zealand archive. Um, there's a great example. Uh, we had some, some very bad earthquakes uh, in Canterbury in the years 2010, 2011, and several hundred people died in Christchurch. And so uh, the University of Canterbury wanted to create uh, if you like, a memorial website that drew on people's experiences and different media um, from across different organisations around New Zealand. And so they, they use the Digital New Zealand API, which is back-ended by Supplejack, uh, to create quite a rich experience for people to tell their stories of you know, survival and, and life after the earthquakes in Canterbury. So because it came out of our own needs, uh, you know, we can see a lot of ways where uh, perhaps there are features developed, uh, built into the product that aren't ideal for a wider audience. So at the moment I'm seeking funding to uh, re-engineer the core product, uh, make it uh, much more modular, um, so we can maybe take out some of the pieces that are only relevant to us and make it easier for um, other users to adapt to their needs and to create new plugins and hopefully to help us with our roadmap uh, and we can you know, co-develop features and get the best benefit out of the fact that the product is open source. Um, and we're very proud uh, that we won last year the New Zealand Open Source Society Award um, for, for government. Um, I knew nothing about it until I came along to the conference and since then I've downloaded the app and I've been, I've been using that and I've heard some, some excellent speakers and um, you know, I think you've done a great job 
so far. The app in particular, I really like um, the search facility, the way of browsing through different um, types of, uh, of, and categories of articles and things. Um, I, I really encourage you to publish the API. I think that's a, that's a fundamental that uh, Digital New Zealand was built on. Um, right from the year we started, 2008, uh, we wanted to develop not only the website, but the API side by side. So uh, I think that's a, a core way of encouraging innovation in the use of the data that's available. So um, there are lots of ways you can um, make that available. Um, really encourage good documentation of the API. So uh, using you know, formal canonical documentation is important, but also more informal sort of exemplar documentation. And that's something, that's a strategy that we've used to try and engage uh, technical, but also semi-amateur audience to access the API and then use that data in different ways to do, to do mashups, to do innovative things that we wouldn't have the time or the energy or the funding to be able to do ourselves. And so it creates a lot more opportunity uh, for people to access that information in different ways. So, uh, you know, a, a lot of times institutions, maybe five, ten years ago, would use crowdsourcing to crack problems that were, you know, they didn't, didn't have the time to solve or the manpower to solve. Uh, and now AI and machine learning in particular are able to solve some of those problems for us. But there are some really great uh, examples of using crowdsourcing to engage with your audience better. Um, and so Europeana Jill Cousins uh, just gave a great talk uh, where she talked about uh, doing um, transcription of handwritten um, notes and diaries and letters uh, in you know, many different European languages. And I think you know, one of the most rewarding things for them was not only having this transcription, which now means that information is searchable and retrievable, but also you know, the stories that they got from the, from the users who were engaged in that process. And, and she showed a lovely video of a, of a young girl who uh, you know, had really been turned on to the information that was available to her um, from Europeana.